This is Control Structure, episode 125 for April 5th, 2017. Huge week to everybody listening. This is going to be the best podcast ever, okay? Because it's an American podcast. The show has notes, beautiful notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs125 to see them. Thank you. I am your one of your hosts, Andrew Bailey. With me today is the other host, Stephen Orvis. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Steve. So, it's uh, been a long two weeks. Uh, I think it's actually been three weeks. I think it has been. So, uh, lots can happen in three weeks, I'd say. Uh, a fortnight and a half? Yes. So, uh, let's see, what was it? That one Saturday it was really nice. Uh, went out and uh, hit the trails outside downtown. First time this year. It was amazing. Nice. Uh, well, go on. I was going to ask you, so you've unconverted your bicycle from uh, being an indoor bike then and, and taking to the trails most every day again? Uh, no, because that was the only freak warm day we had. Oh, okay. So, and the transition is just like lining it up and like pushing a rod that's not too bad. So, um, yeah. Uh, too bad it was only that one day. Um, so, yeah, like, there wasn't any goose poop on the North Shore, so that was good. <laughs> they could normally use that, a lot of that during the summertime. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, and, like, there was tons of people out and stuff, and uh, then I'm like, hey, um, I think my bike, you know, needs to get looked at because, like, the chain is squeaking, and, like, the back wheel is sort of, like, going bad or something. So, uh... You put uh, some miles on it. Yeah. Uh, easily, like, a thousand at least. Um, so, uh, like, a few days later, I, uh, call up the bike shop and ask. And apparently everyone had a collective freak out that Saturday. And, uh, like, sent their bike into the shop. So, like, now they're about a week behind on all their work. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, <laughs> that was, uh, uh, that was, uh, kind of fun anyway. It was good getting out in the, the warm weather. Yeah, so, uh, have you been, uh, out hunting or something? Uh, not hunting. I did go out and shoot my gun on Saturday. Uh, I shot my Captain Ball revolver, which, uh, Matt, if he listens to these, would appreciate that. <laughs> uh, and I ended up breaking one of the springs in my revolver, actually, and, uh, and on Sunday, I went ahead and took apart an old wiper blade and forged a new spring out. So <laughs> <laughs> it was it was it was pretty fun. Nice. So uh, I finally got around to uh, finishing Fallout Four and uh, posting about it. So uh, it was it's easily the longest post I have ever written. Must be a pretty good one then. Yeah. So and uh, yeah, I think I did mention that it's emoji proof now. I can't go leave comments and expect them to be there then. <laughs> well, no, it won't actually even allow you to post them. So you're going to stop me right then. Okay. Yeah, because, like, it's my blog and I can be evil if I want on it. If you don't like my, my comments, that's okay. You can, <laughs> you can do what you want. <laughs> you know, there, there are other uh, venues for that. So, uh, anyways, uh, I guess you're not going to mention it, but... Uh, you know, I had a uh, happy birthday. Happy uh, birthday, Andrew. Yeah, so my car broke and I was fired. Uh, that's a bad day. Um, well, normally. So, uh, let's see, it was... Yeah, because I had used the T, like, for most of last week. So when it came to go to church on Thursday night, I hopped in the car. It started fine, but the gear shift would not budge. Like, not even a little. Hmm. So, like, I made sure to, you know, put the gas, you know, put the brake on, rather. Put the brake on, uh, still wouldn't budge. I turned the car off, turned it on, you know, punched the brake again, still not budging. And I just pretty much sit there wailing on it for, like, five minutes. And, uh, you know, I discovered something about myself. So, uh, like, I think I mentioned that, like, my... Uh, greatest motivation is to see things work and like having things not work is incredibly frustrating to me 
Um, but when a single point of failure uh, fails and it stops me from doing important things like going to the store and so I can eat tomorrow, like I tend to swear. <laughs> so after like five minutes of doing that, I calmed down enough to realize maybe I should ask Google about this. So, uh, uh, I did that, and apparently, uh, like, there's, like, some kind of solenoid in my gear shift that, uh, like, stops it from moving out of park sometimes, but if I popped off the bezel around it, I could reach down and press, like, a manual override so I could shift it. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, so I did that, uh... So, you know, then I'm like, okay, Andrew, uh, if you want to move this car, do not put it in park again. Uh, and that lasted until I got to church when I put it in neutral, put the emergency brake on, and the car would, the key would not come out of the ignition. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, crap. So I had to put it in park just to get the key out. But uh, fortunately, I still had the bezel off, and I could reach down there and get it without much trouble. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, that could not, you know, last too long because I was getting it inspected on Saturday. So, like, you know, having having such a hacky solution would not work. Just to uh, put it in part, guys, it's fine. So, uh, instead, I uh, went to the uh, uh, the Auto Zone got the solenoid in question uh friday uh yeah friday evening i uh you know sat down in the car you know took the center console apart and tried to figure out where to put this thing only to realize that the solenoid was not the problem it was the wiring harness connected to the gear shift like one of those wires had just like shorted out oh. so my hacky solution was to just splice a, a different wire into there and to, like, change the angle so, like, it would work. So, so your car is back functional and, and working fine now? Um, hopefully. Uh, but no telling when that short might come back. At least you know how the temporary fix, if it does. So that's not too bad of a car problem, I guess. So, uh, I still want to take that solenoid back because it costs, like, a hundred bucks. Yeah, that might be good to do. Yeah. Uh, so as... The as... auto parts stores are normally pretty good about that. So, uh, as for the getting fired part, uh, so it was the Monday after the last episode that my boss lady tells me that, uh, some other company has, you know, is interested in acquiring my company. So, uh, yeah, she said that, you know, they're just, you know, buying us out. They're not changing anything. You know, they actually want to come into the market we have. And they like what we do. They they buy. They're buying us for essentially the team. So um, uh, let's see. So as a part of that, we uh, would actually have to get rehired by this new company. So uh, on Friday, uh, like letters were passed around, essentially you know saying we're fired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but by that point, we had already signed papers and stuff for the new company. So you get paid for one day from both companies at the uh, same time? No. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I I was technically fired the day before my birthday. That's pretty harsh. But, uh, yeah, and then I went to back to work today, or no, yeah, Monday, and everything was fine. So is your uh, old boss, was that part of the acquisition too? Is you still have her... Uh, running the company or did is she moving on to other things um so apparently like she's staying on but like she's not like the well i guess she's not the man of the company i guess uh that's someone else now yeah so, so i guess i guess she's staying on to like do sales or something cuz like she's been doing really good sales and stuff since we've picked up like three new companies in the past like couple months hopefully things won't change too much for you then if you pretty much have the same people there yeah so uh tomorrow some people are flying in from kansas i believe 
uh, since that's where the other company is. Uh, and like, we're just like going to like have a, have a few get to know you sessions or something. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's uh, essentially what's going on. So within a year, I've gone from working at, we do commerce on demand where to working at, I think it's like D E G digital or something, uh, working on Salesforce commerce cloud. Which is essentially like the same exact stuff. <laughs> that's that's good then. So hopefully things will stay pretty pretty much the same for you. Except for good changes can be positive though. Yeah. So um, yeah, uh, my birthday, you know, of course, was April Fool's Day. Um, let's see. I I didn't notice any huge or re- at least really any good uh, April Fool's Day things. Uh, but one that is not an April Fool's Day thing and kind of serious is that the default X-Face wallpaper. So, like, you know how I like to run Zubuntu all the time? Mm-hmm. That's Ubuntu with the XFCE interface or something. So the default wallpaper that comes with that uh, might damage hardware when run with an incompatible version of CAT. So um, this might sound uh, weird, but it's actually quite awesome in that uh, because like the, you know, like the sort of uh, mascot for X-Face is like a little mouse that uh, cats like to paw this. So uh, that might end up in, uh, how should I say, scritched monitors. Could definitely have potential for hardware damage there. Not so, often you see a bug like that. So uh, apparently uh, several users have, uh, at least two users have reproduced this. Uh, the uh, current workaround is to uh, change the default wallpaper to that uh, with a dog in the middle of it. Uh, of course, this just in my mind's eye, you know, I can sort of see a cat, you know, pawing the old wallpaper and then changing to the dog, and then just kind of jumping off backwards off the desk <laughs> and running away. You might need a new version of cat. <laughs> uh, yeah, you might want to try dog. Raspberry? 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 Raspberry! Orange. <laughs> orange. Be or- yes, orange. The orange pie is not actually made by raspberry. Uh, but it is a raspberry pie in uh, in body, I guess you could say. Uh, not, I, not, I, not quite the same form factor, I see. Not quite. I believe the header pins were the same uh, on it. But its big selling point is it's only ten dollars, and it includes a two G uh, data connection. So you can make a great out in the woods project or uh, something like that. The sad thing though for me is I said that AT and T doesn't support the two G network, and that was a Freedom Pop SIM card I had laying around. So when I first saw it, I was like, "Wow, I could uh, I could use that for that card," but nah, I can't do that. Hmm. So it's always uh, good to have, you know, competition in, like, these low-end parts. For sure. Uh, as, as well as the high-end parts. Uh, coming soon, actually. Uh, and, well, how about this week's, or at least this week's, this episode's LOL Apple. <laughs> so, uh, remember that whole trash can MacBook or Mac Pro thing? Uh, no. I don't pay Apple tax. Uh, I don't either, but, uh, it was, like, I guess four years ago or so that Apple introduced, like, their high-end Mac Pro system in the trash can form factor. Uh, so, you know, that was, like, a long time ago, and, you know, because, you know, Apple fans are kind of passionate about, you know, their, the way they do things that, uh, like, a lot of them have, you know, started to abandon the, uh, the Mac world, uh, for, uh, PCs, because they're so much faster, and the people who would use these Mac Pros are, like, into video editing and stuff, uh, you know, people who demand the cutting edge of CPUs and stuff, 
uh, which is a problem when your trash can doesn't get upgraded for four years. Uh, so they invited some bloggers and journalists to tell them that Apple does, in fact, have new desktop computers coming next year. Uh, so, you know, in order to buy the current customers over, they are up upgrading the specs on the current model. So uh, they admit that the whole thing about uh, forcing people to use external devices all the time and having, like, next to no... Uh, internal expansion was a very bad idea that did not pan out in practice. So, uh, most high end users want the ability to upgrade and change their computer. Yeah, so, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, how, you know, Apple kind of, you know, lost them back when they started to focus on fashion over functionality. Um, so, like, the big problem was that, uh, the thing had a CPU and two GPUs in it, uh, but you know that's the way Apple thought things were going uh, with the multiple GPU thing. Uh, but apparently, it did not pan out that way, and you know the market headed towards you know bigger single GPUs rather than multiple ones to accomplish something. Uh, add in the fact that uh, you know this is like extremely custom hardware. That you know, essentially upgrading any of it was you know kind of you know an expensive proposition. Uh, like especially like for already uh, purchased systems out there in the field that you know people wanted upgrading. Uh, so I guess that's good for them. Uh, but I'm sticking to my PC. Yes. <laughs> so uh, goodbye, Microsoft Codeplex. And that's a good good. Goodbye, because uh, GitHub is way better. Yeah, so CodePlex was uh, Microsoft's sort of, uh, you know, like, I, I'm not sure how you would call it, like a uh, online repository of open source stuff uh, that, uh, you know, they, they had going, like, what, f f uh, almost 11 years, actually. I was, I was going to say, like, five years, but uh, apparently, according to this... Uh, blog post stating that they are shutting it down. It has been almost 11 years. Um, so they are doing this because uh, GitHub. Uh, even Microsoft uses GitHub now. Uh, so like they really don't have a reason to uh, use uh, CodePlex anymore. Uh, what? So it was based on, like, was it Microsoft Team Foundation server or something? Uh, I believe you said that you use it at your job. Uh, we do use TFS, and yes, being Microsoft's product, I can see how they might integrate with TFS. One thing I do like about what they've done here, if you read the blog post, post they've done a very good job of detailing. They're a very okay, nice you are totally breaking up there. Is it better now? Uh, let's try that, yeah. Okay, so one thing I did like about it is they have a very nice phase-out plan where they they shut off new projects right now, and then I believe in October, they said that they're going to make all the repositories read-only, then eventually they're just going to archive them and have like a final copy sitting out there. So if they if you have a project there posted, uh, there's a way for you to get your code out of there and get it off if you have a backup copy of it, and they've integrated with GitHub to just have a migration over. So that's really nice what they've done. Whereas some of the sites we've talked about that have shut down, they just pull the plug at a certain date, and it's like, if you don't get the data before that date, too bad. Right. But their approach is very nice. I, I like what they did there. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it seems like everyone uh, moved towards Git, you know, just Git as a uh, source control uh, methodology or protocol or what have you. Um, so, yeah, I guess that not many people are sad to see this go. I'm not, because like they said, most projects are moved away now. I think they said in the past, I forget how many days it was, it was like only 250 some projects had been actively had code pushed to it. So it's like no one's using it anymore. They're just seeing the handwriting on the wall. All right. So uh, another thing that not many people should be missing. Uh, so uh, after April 11th, 2017, Windows Vista will no longer receive security updates, non-security hotfixes, 
free or paid assisted support options, or online technical content updates from Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft has provided support for Windows Vista for the past 10 years, but the time has come for us, along with our hardware and software partners, to invest resources towards more recent technologies. So, uh, April 11th. So that would be uh, exactly uh, a week from now. Uh, So, yeah, it has just less than, uh, yeah, about seven days left and, like, some change uh, before we can finally say... Goodbye, Vista. Yeah, I guess it doesn't have the uh, punch that the uh, Windows XP gag did. Windows XP was a nice, nice, loud one. XP was a better, or maybe, well, it was better, but a, a more... Uh, fondly remembered? Fondly remembered, more dependable, more more widely used. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. Operating system, it, it had a bigger impact. Remember, we were talking about the bank's... They used the ATMs that were on uh, Windows XP and, and ones like that. Um, you know, I was kind of trying to think that uh, you know Windows Vista was huge and in, in that it changed like a whole lot of stuff. Uh, in fact, they changed a whole lot of stuff. It became delayed, which is one of the reasons why you know so many people stuck by XP even long after. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it seems like I. I'm the only one that I know of that had a mildly positive view of Vista. Um, so, uh, like, I bought a laptop at the end of 2006, and uh, it it had XP on it. But uh, as soon as I went to uh, Newmont, like, they had the, uh, what was it, like, the Code Academy uh, mm-hmm. thing where, uh, like, you could download all this Microsoft stuff for free. Uh, one of which being Windows Vista. So I downloaded the 64-bit edition and installed it and used it for a long time. And I had zero problems with it. Uh, Plus the fact that uh, it was 64-bit Vista as well. And, like, that thing never crashed, whereas XP did, like, about once a month. Uh, And then, of course, when I built uh, my PC in 2008... Uh, I used Vista with that, and yeah, it did not cause me any problems. I used Vista back when it was an, a release candidate, when they called it Longhorn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> good name. Uh, and it was, back then, I was impressed with it. It looked nice, and I, I don't think overall I had too many problems with it. I, uh, I didn't use it as an everyday computer, but it was more of a trying it out thing. Yeah, the the thing that got most people were printers. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I remember his famous for that. Yeah, uh, like people would, you know, shell out, you know, like hundreds of dollars for a printer, and then upgraded their operating system, and their printer would not have a supported driver for Vista. So then they get angry. Uh, you know, then we have like a lot of mean people screaming everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. So uh, yeah. Whereas I learned like five years prior to that, stay away from printers. Like, you know, as a general rule, just stay away from printers. Um, And to this day, I have never owned a printer. Uh, You know, my parents, uh, they asked me to buy a printer for them, uh, or at least look around for a printer. Uh, But, uh, you know, like, it's not mine. (laughs) So... Do you have a use in society, though? uh, Yes. So, uh, like, for the three pages of stuff i need to print every year i just use do it at work <laughs> if no, that's all it is it's, yeah it's true yeah like no one cares <laughs> so um yeah aside from that you know it was okay one big feature in vista that i feel like got overlooked and is still overlooked was a speech recognition that was when i was trying out the release candidate that was a feature that really impressed me and what it could do and what it was capable of, like the speech recognition. Mm-hmm. We took the time to train it. Actually, was pretty good. Yeah, I remember. I think it was like uh, Office XP. I think uh, had that, and I was using it for a while, and it was okay. Um, but yeah, speech recognition is not a well exposed feature in Vista no. or pretty much any uh, Windows operating system. Um, so. Yeah, and I remember, you know, as with 
pretty much all Windows uh, releases. You know, when it came out, people said, you know, it's slow and bog, you know, bogs down your system. And I'm going to stick with the uh, last release of Windows. Uh, they did this. People said the exact same thing about Windows XP. People mm-hmm. said the exact same things about Windows 98 and Windows 95. And uh, but you, you could fit 95 on floppy disks. That's true. Oh, 30 of them. <laughs> but but even back then it was like quite a chore to oh, yeah. swap out like what the twenty floppies. That, that's quite a bit of swapping. Very stupidly, once upon a time, yes. my father thought that I may as well go ahead and erase all the Windows ninety five floppy disks oh. so that we'd have them. To use. And looking back, I'm like, why would why would we do that? We didn't need floppy disks. Why would we we erase them? That? that was so stupid. Anyways. Yeah, just like buy a box of like what ten or twenty or so, like yeah. like you could get them at like convenience stores and Walmart and stuff. Mm-hmm. Back in the day. Uh, so yeah, in fact, I remember for one Christmas, I actually asked for uh, a bunch of floppy disks, and I actually got them. I I remember using floppy disks to transfer files between computers. You put them in some program like Seven Z, split them up into we make some files and mm-hmm. uh, copy them over one at a time. It takes a while. <laughs> so, you know, floppy disks were marginally better than dial-up. Uh, like, even back when dial-up was the thing, everyone knew it sucked. Yeah, it, it definitely wasn't great. But uh, anyways, uh, let's uh, go on and say goodbye again to Internet Privacy. So, Congress and Trump passed a bill that allows ISPs to track and sell their users' activity without opting into it, regardless of a majority of both major parties' constituents opposing it. So, uh, I guess you can pretty much tell who runs Congress, uh, which are, like, big companies and their lobbyists. Let's try to figure out if there was anything else in that bill, because you know how they, like, the stack things in bills yeah and i'm wondering if that's what's actually going on here yeah because if there was something that democrats didn't want to and say like oh we're making this a privacy issue ha you guys are gonna let isp spy on people no one will like that (laughs) so uh in the senate the vote was along party lines and in the house it pretty much was except 15 republicans voted against it uh, but yeah, still passed, uh, sadly. Um, so, uh, in response, since Congress and the government in general doesn't really care about data or metadata, uh, govtrack.us, uh, has posted a live list of sessions coming to them from the federal government. So I thought that was kind of neat. Yeah. You can see what people are looking at and, uh, yeah. I don't know. It, it, it puts visibility into the issue. It says, hey guys, look at this. Yeah, it it seems fair to me. Yeah, it's their data to share as they wish. Because going to websites is not a private thing, it's really a public thing. Uh, so it just makes it public. Yeah, uh, even though this is HTTPS. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, since you aren't Stephen, uh, speaking to the listeners, that is, since... The listeners aren't Steven. You go out and buy an IoT garage door opener. Uh, for some technical reason, it doesn't work. So you post a negative review on Amazon saying that this is junk. Don't waste your money. The iPhone app is a piece of junk. Crashes constantly. The startup company that obviously has not performed proper QA tests on this. You know, you know stuff that uh, you know, essentially shows your disapproval of this product. Uh, and then, you know, okay, well, this might just be some kind of, kind of fluke issue. Uh, so you go on to the uh, product support forum and say, you know, I just installed this and, you know, uh, I'm trying to get it to work with, uh, you know, the app. It's not working. I uninstalled it, reinstalled it and stuff, and it's still not working. It's a piece of crap. Uh, which, to which the, uh, I guess, Maybe the founder of the company uh, comes in. Uh, he bees, is an enormous dick. Uh, he cuts you off from it. You you know essentially he says that you know the 
Uh, we've identified your uh, garage door opener uh, IDs, you know, serial number, and uh, it's not going to work with our servers. Uh, please return the product. Which and, is someone someone uh, said was basically saying, we've locked your doors uh, for when you come home from work and you can't unlock them. Uh, in addition to essentially insulting the guy. So, um, yeah, completely reasonable uh, action there. And uh, I kind of look forward to this company going bankrupt soon uh, because yeah, because uh, the Sy- Streisand effect has kicked in. Uh, like I, I was just, uh, you know, I just picked up on this, you know, just this morning and the Streisand effect is in full force uh, over 600, I uh, believe it's like 657 of 679 people found the Amazon review helpful. Uh, so, uh, which I'm going to say that it is helpful. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, uh, this has completely blown up and I guess people will slowly realize that, uh, just because you can control things from your iPhone, uh, doesn't make them a better product. Nope. If you build it yourself, then at least you know how it's made. <laughs> Uh, there's that, and there's also the uh, the garage door opener clicker that you put in your car uh, for this. That batteries go dead. Plus, you can't borrow one from your neighbors. Like uh, you could be locked out of your house, borrow someone's phone, log into your Wi-Fi, and then hopefully you have the addresses memorized and uh, go open the garage door. Uh, or alternatively. Uh, you take your garage door opener over to your neighbor and ask, "Hey, uh, I need some batteries." <laughs> That's just too simple. So, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, good luck with that. So, uh, I'm a little excited for Ryzen. Um, I've yet to uh, officially put something together for it, uh, but even though AMD has released Ryzen, there are still bugs, uh, like an FMA bug. So uh, FMA stands for Fused Multiply Add. It's a uh, instruction in the uh, x86 uh, instruction set that you know essentially does uh, like was it A times B plus C like that kind of a instruction. Mm-hmm. Uh, but apparently a, a certain sequence of these uh, can crash uh, a Ryzen chip or and take the whole system down. Uh, like there might be a bug where like that portion of the chip doesn't have enough power to execute that. So like, even if you have a virtual machine running and that virtual machine, uh, issues these instructions, uh, it's going to take down everything. That's pretty serious when you, your VM can take you out. So, uh, uh, thankfully, uh, there are UEFI updates or BIOS updates coming out almost weekly or monthly, which improves performance and fixes things like this FMA bug. Uh, so, you know, continual optimizations are being made. Uh, it turns out that uh, AMD pretty much rushed this off to the uh, motherboard vendors, and they didn't really have time to uh, polish their boards uh, exactly as much as they wanted to. Uh, so this is still like a minor work in progress. So it seems that, uh, you know, like the more you wait, the better it'll be. Like Yeah, let them kind of fix some of these problems. Like as in noticeably better. Uh, like I've been looking at some gaming benchmarks and uh, uh, with a BIOS update that was released like last week. That like sometimes like in a few instances, performance like game performance can go up by like 10 percent. That's pretty significant. So, yeah. Like, if if you're kicking yourself for not buying this, don't. <laughs> uh, so, in proud tradition, Google has released yet another compression algorithm named after Swiss food ending in Li. So, Gwaitsli is a JPEG compression algorithm that promises to squeeze as much as possible out of images at the cost of unreasonable time and memory consumption during encoding. Uh, So, uh, you know, since I'm always on the lookout for better image encoding to optimize the the size of my blog, uh, at least the page loads, uh, you know, this immediately caught my eye. 
So apparently for a one megapixel image, uh, this will take upwards of a minute and like a few hundred megabytes of memory to like essentially brute force the JPEG algorithm to figure out, you know, what's the best uh, possible compression for this image, which, you know, seems okay, but in practice, no. Uh, So I tried to toy around with it and... Uh, like, have you ever tried to compress uh, JPEG? Uh, not very much beyond what GIMP can do. So, uh, like, if you've poked into the advanced stuff, you'll see a quality slider. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so apparently Gwaitsly doesn't want to go below quality 84, which, which, as a rule of thumb on my blog, I don't go above 80 kilobytes per image or quality 80. So, like, I'm below that, so this doesn't really work for me. So I'm, I'm like, okay, uh, this might be, uh, you know, one of those things where if you go up that far, it might be a trade-off, and like, it actually might compress smaller. Uh, no, it ended up being like fifty percent bigger. Oh, okay. So this is this will not do for the Andrew Bailey. I was wondering, I was when I was seeing this, I was thinking about the Google Photos and how they. On their, uh, I'm sure you've seen for backing photos from your phone, they say, hey, you can store them as original photos and it'll use up your space. Or you can store them as compressed photos and it's free and you can do as many as you want. Right. That, this is where something that would shine because you can send the photo to us, I can dump it on some server someplace, and who cares if it it finishes in five minutes or three minutes? It's okay, it's just on my server. I mean, there's a cost to running a server, but... It's just archiving images. In the case of photos, you would want the better quality uh, versus your websites where you want it slightly lower quality. So my advice is to stick with uh, Moz JPEG, which uh, like there's actually discussion on the uh, the Git issues for Moz JPEG about uh, this Gwaitsly thing, and they've essentially came with came with the same solution, which is to like not mess with it so um let's see you you don't use windows much right uh only at work uh so have you ever done the send to compressed folder i have back in windows and me back when compressed native compression was a kind of a new and cool thing so uh i've i honestly have never used uh that like directly in Windows Explorer because like I've always had like 7-zip or p-zip uh, on my system to do this. Uh, but apparently don't use the send of compressed folder to back up an Eclipse workspace uh, or pretty much anything else with dot folders, which uh, you seem to have uh, dug into this pretty well. Yeah, that was... I kind of enjoyed the bug there. <laughs> yeah. So... so. <laughs> He he found that the it's actually stripping out all the folders beginning in dot after the first one when you compress it. But he was saying that probably the w- reason why Microsoft let such a bug exist is maybe they didn't actually able to test it since on Windows you can't actually start a folder with a dot unless you end that folder with a dot. And in that case, it would strip the dot out after the end of the folder and leave the dot in the front of the folder. So you have to really go around it to have folders with dots in front of them. Of course, in Linux, folders with dots in the front are very commonplace because that's a hidden folder in Linux. Yep. Uh, so that's an all-the-time thing. Uh, there's not actually a reason why the, the file system can't have a dot. It's just the way that is. Yeah. yeah that's funny. And so. it, like the thought process behind this, you know, is probably has to do something with uh, like the file extensions. Like it seems to uh, like classify. It's like, oh, this ha- this is a file of type like whatever is after the dot. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but you know that kind of messes up for folders, maybe. So could be it's it's Windows and folder file names are case insensitive. It's already weird. So uh, don't use this to back up Eclipse workspaces. Uh, mm. And then the uh, the kicker down at the bottom. Uh, was, unfortunately, I was unable to get this feature to work on Linux. This only serves to prove that people who use Linux are boring and don't have much of a sense of humor. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) 
So, um, a canonical product manager hit up Hacker News asking what users would like to see in Ubuntu 7.10. Uh, so, uh, I think that this is a good venue to solicit suggestions and discuss, and not in a bug tracker where everything will be closed as not reproducible, won't fix, uh, or in a forum of Kool-Aid drinkers. <laughs> so, uh, this, this guy that claims to be from Canonical, you know, goes on and says, hey, you know, is there any pain points? Uh, so, uh, like, a how should I say this? Uh, do you know of any Linux diehards? Like, Who, me? Uh, maybe a little bit more into Linux than you. More into Linux. Like, uh, like you... personally, people that I know, I don't know anyone more into it. So, like, uh, apparently, like, really hardcore Linux people hate Ubuntu. <laughs> like, if you ever get in, got that vibe? Uh, the, your favorite one, the one that looks like Windows? What? You, the, you, which one did you say? Just you Ubuntu? Just Ubuntu in general. Oh. Um, maybe a little bit because they make it easy in the Unity and such, but not too much. And, like, they take away the, uh, they abstract away some of the minute details. Uh, but, uh, uh, one of the things that I found here, the second most upvoted comment, uh, which, uh, ironically appears, like, about halfway down, uh, is please fix user space issues or just fix space issues with slash boot. That would be good. So, this, this is this was really funny because when I read your your notes here for the show, I uh, just today at lunchtime I had my computer on briefly and I uh, it came up and was like oh no we have zero bytes left on the boot folder. <laughs> so I had to go look in our show notes to find the program that I installed. For uh, removing the yeah. old kernels and yeah, you remember ram it and purge yeah. them. Yeah, remember purge old kernels. I suggested yeah. it. Uh, mm -hmm. So this starts off a conversation of why it's located in the Biobu package. So Dustin Kirkland chimes in. So I'm the author of both Biobu and Purge Old Kernels. It's in Debian because I help push it there after I push it to Ubuntu. It's completely wrong that Purge Old Kernels is in Biobu, rather than in the kernel or directly handled by dpackage slash apt. Thanks for all the feedback here. We'll get that cleaned up in 7.10. And I looked at this again, and apparently this guy did make purge old kernels and Biobu. And I totally, and he's the guy, this product manager that posted this whole topic in the first place. That's kind of funny that it ended up that way that uh, it was him. <laughs> yes. Like, oh, I guess we could fix that. <laughs> this is totally cool. It is. So at some point he said that he put it in Biobu because he wanted the Biobu stuff everywhere he went. So like it was just more like a tag along thing. Uh, he also adds Ubuntu is absolutely doing something wrong here and we'll get that fixed. Wait, so he's blamed Ubuntu for his mistake? Um, not really. Just that it seems like it's just been going on this long. Uh -huh. I see. Uh, so uh, apparently Fedora is listening to this as well. Uh, so, you know, they uh, see Christian Schaller. Uh, apparently he works at uh, Red Hat on the Fedora distribution. And he pretty much goes over all of, you know, the top level points uh unfortunately not the uh the uh boot issue uh but like all the other things like uh, dpi scaling and everything uh with the uh, along with uh, multi-touch battery life uh, UE uefi issues and stuff uh you know like some of the other pain points that uh mm -hmm. were mentioned uh, sure. because, because apparently uh, Red Hat is like one of the main developers behind the GNOME environment. I've heard that they uh, be very good at as far as like drivers and being more on the cutting edge for things like that. So, um, yeah, I remember trying out Fedora like ten years ago, but like everything had like some kind of weird bug with it. 
Like, I remember VLC would, like, crash whenever I tried to play anything with it. <laughs> so, I'm like, wait, this is not how a system is supposed mm-hmm. to work. One interesting thing is he, the guy mentions at the end of his blog post how that uh, adding media support is a legal battle they're working on right now. So that's uh, nice to have that the companies they're fighting trying to make stuff work. Yeah. So another uh, feature uh, is, how should I say this, like kind of dims the monitor throughout the night. Uh, so if you're familiar with Redshift or F.Lux... You know, it kind of like dims the uh, the display like as it goes yeah. through the night. That way, your eyes can kind of adjust with it. Yeah. So let's go to some appreciate. So, data list uh, is uh, an HTML element. It's a way to easily implement suggestions for text boxes. So I was just poking around on the MDN and, uh, you know, found this and I thought it was pretty cool. I don't exactly have a, uh, uh, I don't exactly have any kind of, uh, way to use this, but it's uh, a nice thing to keep in the uh, toolbox. I like the, uh, how you can type in the box and it, like say if you type an I, it brings up all the ones that has an I in it for you. It seems like a handy way to search. Yeah. You know, essentially something like search suggestions or something. Yeah. So uh, my favorite uh, uh, audio format, FLAC, uh, as usual, uh, ziff.org silently released a new version, uh, 1.3.2, uh, back on January 1st. So uh, now you can get uh, a little bit more compression out of everything. It's not that I actually had any kind of like functional bugs with Flack anyway. Uh, uh, so I would also like to appreciate Notepad++ because you should update it right now or force an update check uh, because uh, WikiLeaks uh, did like a whole bunch of stuff uh, about the CIA and apparently the CIA uh, has a hacking tool that specifically targets Notepad++. So, like, you really need to update this. It's kind of interesting how that they specifically go after Notepad++. It is plus, plus, yeah. know, for uh, combating hackers or something. Yeah, so uh, it, it apparently targets the uh, Centella uh, infrastructure or library or what have you. Uh, specifically the SCI Lexer.dll. And it exports only one Funkaton named Scintilla Direct Function, and that's how they, uh, you know, slip their uh, malicious stuff in there. So by uh, the export, is that uh, allowing them to put in the DLL in place of the other DLL, and it's going to call that function in the code? Yeah. Is that what they're doing there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, when I was uh, looking at my blog, uh, I was uh, apparently also meandering around and found a new Markdown implementation. Uh, so Markdown It is a JavaScript implementation that conforms to the common Mark standard. Uh, it also has GitHub flavored Markdown additions, so you can use standardized common Mark with tables and delete tags. So common Mark is essentially the sort of standardized uh, Markdown uh, thing. That mm-hmm. you know pretty much you know separates out. Okay, like these are like a lot of the corner cases that can uh, like you can run into, and you know it actually defines how uh, the output should be. You know, like how it, all that should be handled. So you know that's you know something that I appreciate. Uh, but uh, apparently, even though it's been like what two or three years now that they don't have any support for tables, which I think is a little unacceptable. Tables are kind of nice to have. Uh, Especially because GitHub uh, uses tables in their, uh, you know, pretty much all over. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's something that has been solved, but for some reason, Jeff Atwood kind of hates tables. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I, 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 
I want my markdown to look, you know, kind of neat and tidy. And when I do tables, I don't want to essentially write HTML. You know, I'm, I want to write markdown, something simple. But when I have to write HTML, it becomes not simple anymore. This would be the more detailed explanation of uh, forging uh, the spring from right gun. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the show there, I actually had an old uh, windshield wiper. And currently inside of there, you know how it like flexes and bends? Yeah. There's a little metal spring in there. It's actually not little. It's a long, thin metal spring. <laughs> so I uh, heated it up with a torch and let it cool off so it would be annealed. Uh, so then that allowed me to work it. And like if you bend it then, it would kind of hold its shape. Uh, so I went and ground it down to the shape I needed. And then I heated it back up red quenched it in water, and then without thinking to test it, I like went to bend it, and it just snapped right in half because it wasn't a needle. So I was like, oh, that was stupid. But it was still long enough that I could uh, had what I needed. So I heated it back up again, and then I quenched it, and then I uh, annealed it by just putting it in the flame just a little bit so it turned colors, and then I quenched it, put it in my gun, and the gun worked. I was like, wow, this cool. is the first spring I ever made that worked. Because I made a spring before, but it, it kind of worked for like three times, then it stopped working. <laughs> this one I think is actually a, a good fix. It's going to work. So uh, it was quite a feat for me. My first real spring that actually worked. Awesome. So uh, if you like to send feedback to the show, go ahead and do so on the nexus.tv. Uh, right below are pretty faces uh, on the show notes. Uh, so, uh, don't forget to, uh, uh, also don't forget that today's international backup awareness day. So back up all your stuff. So, uh, uh, by the way, my parents came over, uh, for my birthday as well. Nice. So I asked mom to grab the hard drive over there and, uh, bring it over. And I, uh, swapped the one I had here to give to her to bring back there. There you go. That gives you your offsite backup then. Yep. So thank you, so thank you, Mom, for participating in International Backup Awareness Day. Um, so yeah, so they uh, came over uh, on Saturday. Uh, I had already dropped off my car to get inspected, uh, so I mixed up some casserole. Uh, I chilled out a little bit uh, playing Road Redemption. Uh, then they came in and I started up the grill and. Uh, 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 my mom mixed up some uh, baked beans beforehand, so had baked beans, casserole, hot dogs, and like some little steaks. So, you know, you know, having all these leftovers just ain't the same without you being here, man. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry about that. So, I had my plans all laid, and then they're like, ah, let's do sprint review in another two weeks so we can get this done. I'm like, okay. So, um, yeah, so uh, I'll be having that for like another week or two which is uh fine by me you know yeah uh, leftovers are good means you don't have to make more things <laughs> yeah and you can eat it for lunch and because it's essentially sausage and hash browns you can have it for breakfast too Ooh, this is true so lunch breakfast and supper which which, which i actually did uh on sunday so so yeah, like once once you start thinking about it in that way, yeah, hot dogs and cast, you know, tater tot casserole, you know, is exactly that. That it is. So, um, it's in the sausage, perhaps, but basically. So uh, uh, then later on Saturday, I uh, went and picked up the car uh, and brought the bike to the uh, bike shop, you know, because you know even though they were backed up with all that work, I thought it was like okay, well maybe bring it in and maybe uh like get a new tire for the back wheel and like maybe get a new chain so i can like replace both of them myself mm -hmm. so you know bought, bought the new tire and the guy just oiled the chain and i guess it's fine now oh, that's good so then we uh you know picked up the car and then went to uh the dick sporting goods and uh, picked up some weights so now i don't have to be lifting uh gallon jugs of water <laughs> So, uh, they're like 15 pound dumbbells. Uh, so like they are effectively twice as heavy as gallon jugs. So that your, your water was just conditioning you up to the 15 pounders. So it was a nice progression. Up. Um, in a way, 
Although I was just using the gallon jugs as like being cheap. So yeah. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, yeah. So I've been playing uh, a lot of Road Redemption, which is uh, that one motorcycle game where you can like beat people up. Uh, I think I've showed that one to you. But uh, they did a huge update uh, at the end of last month, and it is amazing. I haven't played it for a few months, and then I started playing it, and it is amazing. Like, it didn't even take, like, an hour or so for me to, like, like be in the zone and, like, feel like I'm accomplishing something and I was having <laughs> fun and stuff. It's everything that a game should be. Oh, must been a good update, then. So, uh... Yeah, it's essentially everything that I wanted to be in the Kickstarter, and there's not done yet. Oh, wow. It's a better Kickstarter than the other one we talked about earlier, with the uh, garage door opener. I noticed that was a Kickstarter. Yeah. Oh, not everything Kickstarter goes out but well. <laughs> yeah, some some of them are actually good and, you know, actually fulfill, follow through on what they want to do. Mm-hmm. So, uh, do you uh, have anything else to add? No, nope, that's about it. I'm looking forward to the warm weather here in yeah. two days, hopefully. Yeah, uh, next Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday uh, look to be pretty warm, so I'll uh, see, uh, uh, see me out uh, downtown, maybe along the rivers. So I'll probably be out shooting guns. <laughs> <laughs> so just don't shoot me. No, no, no. I always shoot safe. Make sure no one's out there and gun range is nice and clear. All right, so have a good one. You too.